Hulk Smash. You're listening to Infinity Rewatch with Andrew Fantasia and Ryan J. Whitehead as they rewatch the MCU in full and discuss like no one else. This podcast is inevitable. Here are Andrew and Ryan J. Whitehead. My friends, welcome to episode one of Infinity Rewatch. We're here. It's it, you know, episode one shouldn't be a milestone, but I feel like it is because this is special. This is a special time, and uh, and there came a day unlike any other mm-hmm. where we started with the invincible armored Iron Man. Oh, and here we are. So that being said, I'm Andrew Fantasia. All right, and I'm Ryan J. Whitehead, and today on Infinity Rewatch, we are covering Iron Man. Uh, Mr. Iron Man himself. I am Iron Man. dun 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 Now, this came out in 2008, so we we were already friends. We had already met mm-hmm. when this came out. We were in college at the time, yep. and I could be mistaken, but I think I saw this with you in the theater. Yes, that we did we did watch it indeed in the theater that this was back in the time where I would watch movies like a good four or five times if I really yes. loved it. Um, but let us set the tone mm. for this 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 time frame. So it's 2008. We're we're fresh into college at this point. Um, and here's the thing. At this point, Marvel's in rough shape. Yes, Marvel was running bankrupt. Like they were about to to go right for broke here. And at this time, Spider-Man did Spider-Man did well, X-Men did well, but they were both part of Sony and Fox. Uh, or uh, yeah, Fox had X-Men, Sony had Spider-Man. Um, and so Marvel, what they did to save themselves was sell the rights to the movies for certain characters. Sony went in, got Spider-Man, and told their guy, just get Spider-Man, don't worry about anybody else, right. just get Spider-Man. Fox went in and was like, dude, X-Men? Yes, please. And Fantastic Four, let's do it. Universal's like, we'll just take Hulk. Everyone's scrambling <laughs> to grab what they can grab. Now, at this point, Avi, Avra, uh, A- Avi Avrad uh, came in and and he had Kevin Feige. And Kevin Feige had been producers on those various films. And he and Kevin Feige's like, look, give me whatever money you got and I'm going to make a film. And they said, can you do it? Can we Can we give you that money and can you make us a film? And he's like, I'm going to do it. And what does he do? He takes a B-listing character named Iron Man yeah. and starts off with a low-budget film, probably in comparison to what the budgets are now, I imagine, yeah. that is nothing. It's nothing. And they they picked it. They picked up uh, John Favreau, who uh, a, a middle area director, somewhat famous, and kind of, you know kind of in the middle right now mm-hmm. and they pick up uh and then they pick up all their scripts and everything get everything going and they're like who's gonna be tony stark and they originally were thinking of tom cruise oh wow i'm yeah. glad they i'm glad that was only originally yeah. thinking and uh and to finally set the tone here um uh, robert downey just got out of rehab and they were like uh kevin's like robert downey should do it and they do a screen test with them and they had to convince the board that he was the best for the role. And at this point, superheroes were not loved. No, Marvel was fresh off of Spider-Man 3, yep. which a lot of people hated. Yep. And Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. Which a lot of people hated. Yeah. So Marvel, that's the kind of tidal wave mm-hmm. Marvel is riding right now. Right. And not only that, is DC had um, Christopher Nolan's Batman Beyond. Or sorry, well, Batman. Batman Begins. So, Dark Batman Knight, Begins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, thing. the Dark Knight came out the same year as Iron Man. Yes. Yeah. And I remember, because I remember in school, people were making fun of us because they were like, they're like, that Batman movie was great, but I like, you know, Marvel's superheroes are lame in comparison. Mm-hmm. And that argument still happens today. Batman will still, you know, trump a lot of a lot of Marvel superheroes. But that conversation is starting to, to tilt on our way because Iron Man... This was the game changer. It was, this, man. Now, at this time, and, and you hear it in the X-Men movies, um, they were making fun of superheroes in spandex. Yes. Cyclops even says a line, what were you expecting? Yellow spandex? Like, the idea of being a Marvel superhero was lame. It's And it's so funny, because that line, in retrospect now, every time I talk about the MCU, whether it's 
on other shows on my channel, whatever, I always end up referring back to that line to show how far we have come. Yep. Because we are so ingrained now in the comic bookiness of comic book movies mm -hmm. that if we watched a Thor movie where Thor is not in a red cape with those big silver things on his nipples walking around with a helmet, we'd be like, what the hell, Marvel? Where's our Thor? And, and we even say that about his winged helmet today. Where's his winged helmet? Yeah. It's crazy. So, like, we we literally went from <laughs> yellow spandex, oh, that's stupid, we're, we're just going to wear leather and trench coats, to, uh, like, literally everybody is decked out to the nines in their comic book costume. Sometimes they even make it, like, a, you know, you have to earn the costume. you got to build up to it, and those are a lot of fun, too. Yep. Um, I know it's, like, sort of canon, but not really, but Luke Cage did a lot of that when he was escaping from the lab and he had the 70s costume Oh, on. I love that. And, oh, like, it's so good. They, they, they know... Everybody who makes these knows the costumes and they know how to get a rise out of us just by letting us see the costumes. Yep. That in itself yep. is a little piece of candy in the bigger Willy Wonka chocolate factory that is every single Marvel film. Yeah, and and so in, you're incredibly right. And and that being said, uh, a lot of people didn't want to own up to being in a superhero movie too. Mm -hmm. Like the only person who really had the best justice, if you will, was Michael Keaton's Batman yeah. uh, with Tim Burton. And uh, so at this point, guys, that's where the tone is right now. Superheroes are not exactly the greatest thing. Um, and uh, like in terms of like where the movies were at now, Spider-Man was doing well, but the third one was a big like, like it kind of just reminds us that like these are kind of just superhero movies are kind of cheesy. And then Iron Man. Iron Man comes along. He swings into frame like Spider-Man, but, yep. but with more metal. And I wrote this down because I was trying to find out yesterday because, you know, I, I turn on Iron Man and I'm watching it and the Paramount logo comes careening towards me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, this was a Paramount picture. That's right. And I was like, I'm curious. So Iron Man came out in May 2008. Do you know, Ryan, when Disney bought Marvel? I know it's during Captain America or just before production of Captain America. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to say it was I don't know the exact month. But I'm gonna say it was. I'm gonna say it was June, of of so two years later, so 2010. You're you're a little bit off. Um, oh no! They they brought up the deal. Yeah. Disney announced the deal, saying, "Here's what we want to do. We we want to swallow Marvel whole." <laughs> um, they brought that up at the end of August 2009. Really? Yeah. That so soon? A year later, I think they had good foresight. Somebody was like, "That Iron Man movie, guys, we gotta, we want this." Uh, so in the following summer, in August, they proposed the deal, and then December 31st, 2009, oh. the, the deal was finalized to the tune of 4.2 billion. U.S. dollars. The merger was approved. Uh, and since then, uh, and it's funny because 2009 was the only year since the MCU started that has had no MCU films in it. 2009 was that one empty year because they were busy getting bought by the mouse. And then, uh, then the they house started, of mouse, the house of mouse just, it's, it gobbles up your soul. Mm -hmm. It gives you a lot of money for your soul though. Uh, and, uh, there you go. Then all of a sudden you are owned by Disney. Uh, and I noticed something too, speaking of opening logos and stuff like this, I did not catch this ever, but the opening title, when you see the title Iron Man come on the screen, it's the exact same font and animation as the Avengers titles. Yes, they, yes, yeah. that's right. And I, I, I don't think any other MCU movie does that. Mm -hmm. I, I just noticed it. I was like, oh, God. And I think my mom was in the next room. She's like, what's the matter? And I'm like, oh, nothing. I, I just... I just, I just saw a naked lady on TV. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm watching HBO Skinamax. That's what's going on. Nothing nerdy here. Go back to sleep, Mom. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed finding that out. And and what a way to kick off that film. You start off in, you know, in the desert, and it just kicks off with ACDC back in black. Like, you couldn't, couldn't set a more, couldn't set a more heavy metal tone. Um, and it's, it's military, it's guerrilla, and you just see Tony Stark there just owning the scene with the glass of, I don't know what he's got, but, uh, he's got that glass in the, in the Humvee and yeah, right out of the gate. And, and it's, and I love the storytelling because it, it doesn't take place in the middle of the story. It doesn't take place in the end of the story. It starts off just, just before like the big, you know, before big stuff gets real. Yeah. Before stuff gets real. And so 
um, yeah, uh, he's he's with his military buddies, having the time of his life, and they want to take photos with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, he says the interesting line that uh, you know the guy throws up the gang sign. He's like, "Peace, yeah, be out of a job with peace." Yeah. Right? So, um, which is interesting because because that's cap. That was Cap's struggle. Cap's yes. struggle was yeah. he wanted a perpetual war because that's where he he felt where he was home. He's the super soldier. What do you do if you're yeah. Not not a super soldier, he's, right? He's gonna get a job at like a, a grocery store uh, or Baskin Robbins. A Baskin. Yeah. Robbins. <laughs> hey Cap, uh, this lady's waiting for her ice cream sundae. What's the deal here? Yeah, or or, uh, or that kid from Ant Man. Can I have a hot dog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah, so I I did notice that right out of the gate was the 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 immediate tone was the guy's like yeah peace and he's like yeah I'd peace I'd I'd be out of a job without peace right mm-hmm. um, and then of course explosions hit boom and he's he's uh you know all he's on technically trying to escape and i love the irony that the missile hits and it says stark industries the on it iron e oh, oh i love it I love that's it. not the last time i'll make that joke <laughs> uh, and i think it, it goes without saying obviously if you're listening to this i don't need to tell you this but robert downey jr i mean the choice he made to play this guy where like this is a man whose mind is going a million miles faster than everybody else's mind. You can hear it in the way he speaks. Yeah. He is speaking at like such a pace that he would get pulled over for speaking too quickly and he'd get a ticket. He is just uh, like he's he's on a whole other level of intelligence and a whole other level uh, socially too. Like he's not uh, he's not a shy person, but he's not a social person. No, he's 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 almost sort of like on some kind of spectrum where he's like, if everybody's at a party, he'll be off in a corner, like chewing his nails and being like, you know, if I do this and I do that, and, and everybody else is just having a good time, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's great, that's great. I'm I'm having a beer here. I'm talking to this cute girl, but you know, I just realized if I build this and I I tweak this here, I can have 14 percent. Like he's just going. And that is a, a choice that he didn't necessarily have to bring to the character. He could have just been like, hey, I'm a playboy and I'm a billionaire. But he found that sweet spot where he's like, this guy is not just a playboy billionaire philanthropist. He's a genius. And that's that's what he latched onto. He's a genius. And that made it believable. That made it more than just like, because remember, we live in a world. And I, I it sucks to say this, but we live in a world where somebody thought let's cast Denise Richards as a nuclear physicist in James Bond. The world is not enough. And we all know what came of that. So here's a guy who is, uh, you know, I, he's not, I don't know how old RDJ is. I don't know how old Tony's supposed to be in this movie, but here's, mm-hmm. here's a guy who's roughly middle-aged, very, very handsome movie star, good looks, billionaire. And we're supposed to believe he's also a genius. That can be hard to swallow for the audience, but he made the choice to make it very easy to swallow. He coated that pill with glistening, whatever, plastic, something that goes down smooth. Yeah. And now you look at him and you're like, yeah, that guy could build Ultron. Yes, of course he would know what, how, a, of course he can go into a cave with a welding torch and make a suit that, that's bulletproof. Of course he can. Yeah. It never once makes you have to suspend your disbelief. He was able to build this in a cave with a bunch of scraps. With a bunch of scraps! <laughs> I love that scene. Um, yeah, so uh, I agree with you. Like you, he, I think what really happened when this movie came out was you just instantly believed that RDJ was Tony Stark. Yeah. Like you just... There are actors where you're like, oh, you know, like, like Christian Bale played a good Bruce Wayne in Batman... But you you look at it as Christian Bale playing a good thing. Where this time with the Marvel, and you see it with all the Marvel heroes, or I'm going to say like pretty much majority of them, where it's the reverse. You see them as the character and less the actor. Right. Um, and, and RDJ is the godfather of this, where he just sets a tone and I can't see him outside of this, this role. And for actors, that's usually a bad thing. But for in this media world that we live in now, this is huge. You want that. Mm-hmm. You want that because this will kick you off to do great things. And and RDJ was also the first to own it. In all the interviews post Iron Man, he comes out and just owns the room. Yes. Just owns it. And same in this movie, like like that scene, that establishing shot of 
holding the glass in a military vehicle and just drinking and they're asking him like stupid questions like oh is it true you went 12 for 12 with the maximum cover models mm -hmm. and he's and he just owns the answers like you don't see him hesitate he just like responds right back yeah um and yeah it just just owns it and so that being said the after the explosion happens you know you see him and the beautiful thing you see you see kind of the you see him in with the terrorist group and the whole thing and then it rewinds back 36 hours to kind of establish why he was there right right that's a great choice by the by the screenwriters too mm -hmm. that really it uh it made it feel like like already he has one of the coolest origins i think of any superhero it's not a lab accident it's not this or that his origin is so unique and as i was watching it last night i'm like god this is such a cool origin like mm -hmm. he with his own bare hands he made himself into a superhero um, and it was a, it was a cool way. I think they recognize that it's not like other origins. So they didn't tell it in a super linear way, mm -hmm. which I liked. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about, talking about really establishing the story, it was really brilliant of, of John to set up this action sequence where it's not long. It happens very quickly, but the beauty is, is like, okay, yeah, he's this, he's this billionaire. Like, if you went in not knowing Iron Man, and I think this is kind of the beautiful world of Marvel movies, is you have the, you have two very different audiences seeing two very different movies. Yes, a hundred percent. But the beauty is, they all meet in the middle at the end, mm -hmm. right? And so, so you establish the shot, and and boom, you know, truck gets hit. You know, they're telling him, stay there. He's scrambling. He's running around. And you're just like, you have that moment of like, what just happened? And then the beautiful part is 36 hours earlier. Yes. And it takes you right to the beautiful award ceremony uh, uh, in Vegas, which is fantastic. A uh, great way to start it. And, and, and talk about origin stories. What does the award ceremony do? They talk about his dad and the yeah. legacy his dad left. Uh, and comparing Tony to his dad. And, and it's a beautiful transition because they're like, oh, Howard Stark did this, did that. And and uh, then the passing of a Titan. And and then they talk about Obadiah, Obadiah Stane filled in the gap until Tony Stark comes in and he's you know trying to fight for a better tomorrow. Right. Here's the cool part, though. You ready for this? Yes. This is a note I took. So his best friend comes up, uh, uh, which is James Rhodes. And and already as a comic book fan, you're getting a lot already. You get James Rhodes right mm -hmm. out of the gate as a character. So you know you're in for a treat because you already see one of the characters. Um, and James Rhodes says, um, uh, you know, I'm here to honor uh, a true or a real patriot. Ah. He says right out of the gate, a real patriot. Uh and he's, I, I've had, I've had the honor of working with a real patriot, and so this is where I think talk about planting the seeds down the road because Iron uh, Tony Stark never liked Cap out of the beginning. Their friendship was forged through the the difficulties, but but when you when we get to the Avengers, what you're gonna notice is he talks about this is the guy my dad would never shut up about. But Tony Stark through this award ceremony was constantly compared to his dad. And then his friend says he's a real patriot, and his his best friend is a soldier himself. Yes. So you have this beautiful setup right there of a good hero story. Oh, I love that. Right out of the gate, you, mm. you want a good notes, man. That's yes, well it's done. Gold, my friend. I have. I, I'm glad I have another note to match that because Ooh, okay. I, I, I saw something cool where I was like, okay. This uh, this is the first movie of the Infinity Saga, mm -hmm. and it begins with uh, you know after our initial scene we cut to this thirty six hours earlier whatever, and it begins with a video about sort of the um, the accomplishments in the life of Tony Stark. Yes, the final movie of the Infinity Saga is Far From Home, and it begins with a video about the accomplishments in memoriam of oh. Tony Stark. Hey! Wow. Symmetry. Symmetry. That's a bookend, ladies and gentlemen. Oh wow. <laughs> that yes. Well, yeah, okay, wow. This, this is gonna get this is gonna get heavy, man. Yeah. Alright, so there you go. So absolutely, man. They, they absolutely crush it with that award ceremony. Um and comparing and I love that. Yeah, his legacy, right? Mm -hmm. Um so so yeah, so right out of the gate, they they kind of already pit him against his dad, and they said his dad fought against the, the Nazis who worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, there was no reference of Captain America there, but but you can tell that his dad has done a lot more than what 
Tony has done. But he's and then Tony says his job is to save the world, which his overall vision was to put an armor around the world. Right? Yeah. Um, so that's the beautiful thing. And then. Um, and then you see, and then you kind of get to the transition where he's like, Obadiah comes up and he's like, as you can see, I'm not Tony Stark. Funny thing about Tony is he's always working and then you see him classic. Mm. And, and a beautiful thing is, is really they focus on the mild mannered version as opposed to like, oh, you know, Iron Man, Tony and go back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. They do. They, they did that wonderfully. And just like, like you said, it was two different movies for two different kinds of audiences. Mm. And that first couple moments of like him in Afghanistan and then this introduction in Vegas I just kept thinking of like somebody who's not a Marvel fan or a comic fan watching that would, be, would still be riveted they'd just be like who's this man and like what's gonna happen to him now that he's he's in this horrible situation like yeah. the worst possible situation you could be in uh it's like across the board they did a great job of of kicking off this guy's story and because he's such a b-list marvel character yeah uh it, it serves even more to make us interested in what he's all about mm -hmm. now you mentioned that they never bring up captain america um obviously because they're you know they're just talking about howard stark very briefly mm -hmm. and i think that's an interesting point because everybody sort of like uh like i said last time in the intro how you got me hooked on on uh, comics again and on wizard magazine and stuff and wizard magazine at that time was rife with info about comic book movies. Like during that period of time, you could not open a page of Wizard without seeing either Heath Ledger's Joker or RDJ in the in the Iron Man armor. It was just mm -hmm. everywhere. They're like, oh, new reports from the Iron Man set, blah, blah, blah. And at the time they were talking, I was reading like article after article that Jon Favreau was doing interviews and stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was early days um, because we met in the first, our first year of college and then Iron Man came out in our second year of mm -hmm. college. Mm -hmm. So for that first year of college, I remember reading Marvel, um, excuse me, reading wizard. And they're always saying like, Oh, here comes Iron Man. It's going to come out soon in a year. And in early days, do you remember when they were saying Mandarin was going to be the villain? Yes. That was yeah. a big thing. And even Favreau was on in these interviews saying like, yeah, we're working on a good way to bring Mandarin into the 21st century. Cause you know, he wasn't a very racially sensitive character. So we want to try to find a good way to do that. Now, obviously they didn't get around to that, but one thing that those comics, excuse me, those magazines, I'm clearly in a comic book mood here. One thing those magazines always stressed was this is the first movie in what Marvel Studios hopes to eventually be a shared universe. They said Marvel is working on Thor, they're working on Captain America, and if all goes well, Marvel really, really wants to do an Avengers crossover. So that was in the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. Now, do you remember when Iron Man came out and like around the time you went to go see it, do you remember that floating around as a rumor? Did you know about that? Because even back then, internet wasn't what it is now. No. Uh, even though it was very prevalent, it's not mm -hmm. a place where we would hop on and be like, ooh, what's the what's the story, Feige? What are you up to now? Uh, that's what Wizard Magazine was, for, <laughs> was uh, doing for me. So did you do you remember going into that movie with that mindset of like, this is movie one? Yeah, I, I actually did. Um, I did, at the time as a fan, knew it was going to be, there was going to be an Avengers movie. Like the possibility was there. But again, it was it was a, it was the challenge of technology versus perspective, right? Mm. Can they afford to do an Avengers movie? Because to be fair, before Avengers came, there was no movie to that scale, no. not even close. There was Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, and that's literally it. That's yeah. and that's it, right? Like, like when when and it's funny how you talk about Wizard Magazine, which again, if you wanted like quality information, you went to Wizard. Like Wizard. They, they had incredible amount of detail. Today, you can get news quickly, where back then um, you didn't. But today, you get news quickly, but it could be a rumor. It could be speculation. It could be all these different things. Um, but back then, when news came out, it was there was sources. There was, there was quality, tangible yeah. pieces. There to was it. no Mike Zero back then. Yeah. Exactly. Guys, Ray is C-3PO's father. <laughs> confirmed confirmed explained <laughs> so so that being said yes i in answer to your question yes i knew avengers was coming mm -hmm. but my mind was not ready for it like in terms of just like i i personally 
felt that the movie industry wasn't ready for it. We weren't ready for it. But what we're seeing could lead to the possibility of it. Um, and with the Mandarin, yes, I, I, I heard that John Favreau was approached to by Avi Avarad, who who has always been very ambitious with films. That's mm-hmm. why Spider-Man 3 was just a mess of characters Ooh, yeah. because, because they knew the more you put in, the more you get out. But what, what they didn't realize, and it's very much an acting thing, where it's like less is more. The comic book audience knows where this is going. And, and yes, you can still surprise them, which I'm still amazed that they still find ways to surprise me every single time. But at the same time, they know that they need to... Like these movies are not for they're they're as much for the comic book fans as they are for getting new fans. And that's why we're in an age today where like we're doing podcasts about about these infinity about the infinity saga because back then you wouldn't normally talk about it. When we mm-hmm. when we were in class, we had a very small group, very small circle of friends, like two other guys that we would talk about it with because other people just didn't get it. Like right. just didn't get it. So yeah, they were off doing square things like having sex. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Who's laughing now? Chris. <laughs> Probably still you. You were a very handsome man. So handsome. All yeah. right. So, so yes, John Favreau was asked to do Mandarin, but mm. he, though he was excited to do it, he was afraid because you can't just go straight to the top. You can't go directly yes. for the rival. Yes. Um, and and there's and, and not only that, Mandarin is a hard villain to do because he challenges technology. Right. And Iron Man challenges magic. They're the counterpoint to each other. And, yeah. and you're right. Like Mandarin is the top. And I, I always used to think like back when this movie came out, I was like, this worked so well. And it def- it flew in the face of what superheroes were doing because every time you you kick off a superhero franchise in films, what do you do? You go with the arch villain. Yeah. First Superman movie, you got Lex Luthor. First Batman movie, you got Joker. Joker yep. First Spider Man movie, you got the Green Goblin. First X Men movie, you got Magneto. Like they always go for the the top of the Fantastic food chain. Four. You got Doctor. Fantastic Doom. Four. You got uh, a, a guy wearing a Doom suit and a Reed. <laughs> Hey Reed, I don't really know what my powers are, but uh, if you'd be so kind as to just you got a uh, guy wearing a doom suit, uh, we're not sure if he's the real Doctor Doom. I'm just gonna make these lights flicker, Reed. I really like power. Uh, so it, it well was, done, <laughs> well done. It was such a uh, like a slap to the face of of that tradition to be like, yeah, Mandarin is the, your go to villain for Iron Man, but we're gonna go with like how popular was Iron Monger? Oh, dude, he was at the and, bottom of the barrel. See, and that that's so ballsy of them to do that. It, dude, it, it just, yeah, it just rocked my world. And mm-hmm. and I over the years, like in the past couple of years, you know, I watch a lot of people, a lot of YouTube personalities and stuff who talk about Marvel. And one thing that I always hear is that Marvel at first was had was you know amazing movies amazing heroes but they always struggled with coming up with good villains up until we got people like Loki yeah. and Thanos and, yeah. and like Killmonger and stuff I will say to my dying day to my last breath like on my deathbed when my family's around me I'm going to say Iron Monger is still one of my favorite villains in the MCU I think wow. Jeff Bridges is fantastic mm-hmm. he is so good at, at, as this villain and my family's gonna be like andrew don't you have anything more important to say to us and i'm like no i need people to know that this man is because he was just he played it so well where he was tony's friend and he's always friendly and he's like watch you can make a drinking game out of the iron man movie take a shot every time obadiah stain puts his arm around somebody and gets uncomfortably close to them with a smile on his face he, that's that's his go to move he'll be like tony tony look look tony the shareholders are not happy to-. Yeah. and like he, he's he gets all up in your face and he's he's still smiling that poisonous smile at you uh, and and it's so threatening because you feel like this guy is a part of tony's life he can't tony can't just like punch him or shoot him or arrest him and that's it like this guy is integral to him and his company he's one of the few family-ish members that tony has left in his world yeah and then this guy you find out just how horrifically evil he can be like the lengths he's going to not Mm. to jump ahead but like the scene where gwyneth paltrow is getting that stuff from his office on the flash drive oh scariest scene in the mcu to date i don't care what anybody says yeah 
And when and then she runs out and Coulson's like, hey, we have that meeting. She's like, yep, yep, walk with me. And and he's just like looming up on the balcony. Oh my god. Oh, how yeah. how can you say Marvel has not had good villains mm-hmm. when their first villain out of the gate is still one of the best? Obadiah stained, yep. Um, and it's it's brilliantly done because again, the audience that never seen an Iron Man movie, I would argue, as someone who like had to put on like that lens of like we're watching this for the first time and trying to keep my comic book knowledge in the back of my head like you could almost be duped that he was that he was going to turn cuz like he's mm-hmm. so friendly at first yeah. right and it, they set him up to look like the supporter yeah he brings him pizza yeah. what villain brings pizza well, he, and he talks about like I'm fighting for you but yeah. you need to lay low for me do this but going back to so kind of still going with the film here it's brilliantly done going back to the mandarin because and this is where, it, again, the two audiences are still separate because you have that video they make where he's captured and then he's, uh, you know, tortured and all that stuff. And he meets Jensen, um, which Jensen was normally played by uh, by an Asian man. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because uh, I think in the uh, comics he was a Vietnam prisoner of yeah, war, he was right? a Viet- Yeah, he was a v- uh, Vietnam prisoner of war. Uh, and, uh, and, and he is captured by the Mandarin and they're both captured by the Mandarin. Ooh. So the beautiful way they did it this time, and I loved it and talk about, talk about not giving you the arch enemy right away. They give you a faction called the 10 rings. Mm. And if you're a comic book fan, you clearly know what that's a re- If you don't, you don't read enough Marvel because yeah. one of Mandarin's famous lines is 10 rings, a thousand ways to die. Mm. And, uh, and, and yeah, so. The beautiful thing about it is, yeah, at first you see the symbol and you see the rings, pay no mind of it. It's just like this video straight up of Tony Stark being captured and they're talking different language and they're like, later on you find out he's like, um, Obadiah, uh, you did not tell us that the target you wanted us to kill was the great Tony Stark and Mm -hmm. then he gets into the whole thing. Um, Anyway, so yeah, uh, the guy captures him uh, and yeah, you find out that the faction is called the Ten Rings and it's taking place... Um, in the uh, in the desert there, uh, it looks like they said it's go uh, close to Galmira, um, and I, I I don't know the exact location. I was trying to find that in the in the movie, um, but yeah. So, anyways, it's in the desert, and so the Ten Rings is is seems like it's a huge faction that influences pretty much. I would say uh, the Middle East of of the world, right? Which which in my uh, speculation of Stark Legacy kind of moment here is um, I looked at where Gilmira could be and it's kind of in guitar, guitar kind of kind of area. And it's not too far from Egypt. Ooh. Okay. Which if you do your Marvel knowledge in the recent announcement of Moon Knight, that is where Mark Spector becomes Moon Knight and he's a mercenary. So... I like where this is going. Right? So, I like where so this is going. So either Mark Spector is known to be a rich man with multiple personality disorder, but he was a mercenary and he was a part of the U.S. military as a Marine. So it could take place during the events of Iron Man because there was a lot of struggle happening there and they could be fighting the Ten Rings. That's... I, that I really like where that's and my that. evidence to that is that Shang Chi is taking place with the ten uh, ten rings being an enemy faction, mm-hmm. um, and so Moon Knight takes place in Egypt, which again, guys, geography wise, it's close, but it's not like hugely close um, to compare. It's like it's like Egypt adjacent. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm like trying to compare distances here, and I'm gonna say like. It's like, I don't know, two provinces over kind okay. of thing. But it's it's still relatively close. And it could, those events could be related. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it will because like Ten Rings, like you have Hydra. And Hydra seems to be the big bad, uh, the big bad faction of um, Infinity Saga. But I think they're going to explore the Ten Rings being an enemy faction. Because in Iron Man, they have a lot of problems. Like a lot of problems. Like... Uh, Rhodes talks about that's his active war zone, so that means he's been fighting the Ten Rings for a long time. Yeah. So there's I think, a lot of world building yeah. just in this movie on the Ten Rings. So I think I think uh, I think we're gonna see some more of a, some Moon Knight cross Iron Man action there. Ooh, I'd be now. I I have a question regarding the mm, Ten Rings. Ask for, me for you for your specific knowledge here, because as I'm watching last night, I'm like, okay, you know, I know it's the Ten Rings. We know we got Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings coming out. Uh It's been announced Mandarin is in that movie now. The Mm -hmm. legit Mandarin, not 
Ben Kingsley in a costume oh, and I'm not so uh, not Guy Pierce in another costume with oh, a God. tattoo. Yeah. Um, we're getting real Mandarin. Mm-hmm. So. Oh God, we're gonna have to watch that movie too. I know. Uh. Yeah. Watching uh, watching this now, I'm thinking, all right. So that that man who is running this terrorist cell here, the bald man yeah. who gets his face messed up. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is what I thought, and tell me if 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 this makes sense. He is wearing a very big ring. Yes. So my mind immediately went to, okay, I'm picturing Mandarin as this, like, a Wilson Fisk of, like, Shanghai who just chills out in an office tower in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And he's got 10 dudes, 10, like, lieutenants um, all around the world in different spots who are just heading up these horrible terrorist organizations and doing like unspeakable things in the name of greed and whatever mm-hmm. and and to build up mandarin's power and they are his 10 rings they are these these uh these 10 people who go out and they do the, the worst of the worst for him yeah uh, now do you think that's possible and b that bald guy is he a comic character is that somebody that's like a person no, or, no, that's just that's strictly for the movie. Strictly for the movie. Okay, because uh, I know in the comics they are literal rings he wears with magic powers. Yeah. but I don't five know. five rings on each hand. That's a, that's a bit of that's a lot. That's that's garish. <laughs> that's, that's, that's yeah, that's a bit garish. He's he clearly he's a, he's the type of man who flaunts his money. <laughs> yeah. He would get along with Wilson. Well, Fisk. he okay. So originally he manufactured those rings through mm-hmm. like a combination of science and magic, um, and he's he's actually a pretty good scientist as well as a you know a sorcerer, if you will. Um, but there, there have been interpretations of Mandarin where the, the magic, cause the magic of, if you look at Dr. Strange and you look at, you know, the shielding powers of the Vishanti, the daggers of Danak, the crimson mans of Sidorak. I can't get enough of the crimson mans of Sidorak. Right. Uh, right the flames now. of the fall team. Yeah. Um, that one I can take or leave. <laughs> what, what was really cool. Um, actually you learn about this, uh, and one of my favorite comics, actually, you learn about this is that those spells are aliens that came to earth and they teach you mm. how they work so it's kind of like just super advanced science right like asgard like asgard yeah right oh don't get me started <laughs> on that um anyway so but the way marvel does it in the comics is they explain that technically it's still magic but it's it's that thor explanation of yeah it's 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 not that it's it's not that it's mag- like magic is a science they don't understand yet. It's magic and science are the same thing. Yeah. But you got to look at it differently, right? It's science your mortals couldn't yeah, possibly where, and, and, and we'll talk about that in Thor where I where I really have an issue with Jane Foster in this oh, whole thing. Oh, I can't wait for but, that. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. We're talking about Iron Man. I heard Jane so, Foster died of sadness. <laughs> hey Oh. No. All right. So yeah, I, so Mandarin, do you, is, this, is this whole idea yeah. of like, him giving the rings right yeah so he doesn't he ne- i've never seen him in my knowledge of the comics i've never seen him give out his rings he okay. always holds on to his rings but that was a popular theory because in iron man 2 when and we'll watch for this and i tell you to watch for this when um when ivan venko get uh, yeah gets the uh gets his passport he talks to a guy who has a ring on his hand Oh, okay. So there was that theory going on for a while that yes, there there was he gave it to a different lieutenants. So there is the possibility of that, but in my knowledge, I don't think Mandarin has ever given away his rings because why would you, right? Right. Like, if you're that bad. But yeah, so they established the ten rings, and so already I'm stoked because I'm like, oh my god, the Mandarin. And if and when you grew up in the '90s with the Iron Man cartoon crude though it may be in terms of animation it was done in like the early ni- late 80s early 90s um he has green skin or something doesn't he, he has yeah it's kind of like lights green skin but he is a major villain yeah throughout the most of the cartoon um so so yeah so those of you who grew up with it grew, grew up with the show you're you're expected expecting mandarin like just as much as i was hoping to see um a female character uh, be the mild mannered version of Spider Woman, uh, right. Jessica Drew. Right. But um, but yeah, no, we didn't see that at all. But I was hoping anyway. Uh, so yeah, so Tan Rings, yes, Mandarin knew it was happening, knew it was leading up to Mandarin, and yes, hoping for Avengers. So they established that, and then you meet Jensen, and it's a perfect contemporary version of Jensen. Oh, Jensen's he's such a sweet. I love yeah. and and his final words. 
Uh, like, again, I've never looked at Marvel retrospectively till now, and I'm so glad I did because his final words were, he's like, don't waste your life. Yeah. So he's like, thank you for saving me. He's like, don't waste it, man. Don't waste your life. You can tell that has been carried by Tony ever since for these other 22 movies. He's yeah. carried that around. He's like, I'm not going to waste my life. Yeah, and, and, you know, he talks about how, you know, you're a man who has everything, a man who has nothing in comparison that, that he doesn't have a family, right? Mm-hmm. And so that kind of, you kind of see him forging that idea of the Avengers through that experience because uh, I'm pretty sure the way he talks to Cap is like, he's like, I'm trying to not tear up the tear up the Avengers, or not try, try not to tear the Avengers apart. So you kind of see he has that family protection going, mm-hmm. right? Um, and he loves it. He loves being a part of the Avengers. Like he absolutely loves it. Uh, and so, yeah, so Jensen was a really, really genuine character. Um, and the beauty is, is he says, that's your legacy Stark based right. on, you know, them having the weapons and the, and they wanted to build the Jericho missile and he's trying to figure out why they have his guns. And again, it goes back to that beautiful award speech. And really, there's a lot of gems in that award speech that there's a lot of subliminal things that are happening here because Tony Stark believes that he says to uh, Christine Everhart after his award ceremony that peace... I can't wait to talk about her. Peace, uh, (laughs) Christine Everhart, yeah. Peace is... uh, My dad taught me that peace is having a bigger stick than the other guy. Yeah. And then she says... and And the beautiful thing is, remember, Rhodes says he's a real patriot. Right. And 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 Tony feels he's doing the right thing by building all this technology because his dad, you know, helped the war and helped essentially save everyone. And he says that in his interview with Christine Everhart. And then Christine Everhart just reams him for it. Like, oh, you know, what do you think of your nickname? The Merchant of Death. Uh, Peace means uh, bigger stick coming from the other guy. And then she says uh, that's a great line coming from the guy who sells the sticks. Mm -hmm. And so she challenges him on being a hero right out of the gate. And being this patriot, if you will, um, which is funny because he uses that kind of American line of like, yeah, you know, mm. Mm, right? And and he says, um, so yeah, he goes, uh, do you care to talk about, you know, the IntelliCromps, all that funding came from like military funding, right? And so she goes like, wow, okay. But like you see him trying to prove that he is a hero. Like he's right. he's saving the world today. He's doing it. And then the beautiful part of meeting Jensen, he realizes right then and there that he is the problem and he is not the hero that his dad would have wanted him to be. And that is a beautiful way to set up his story. Oh, so much. And like when when that guy, I don't know his name, but that guy takes him out of the cave and shows him like, oh, look, I have your missiles. I have this yeah. and that. I want you to build this for me. And that's when you see in Tony's face when he's looking into that fire and he's like, I, everything I made that they have, every person they kill is going to be because I made those missiles. Yeah. And ah, uh, there you go. There, That's what I mean. Like this origin story is so, so leagues well ahead. Done. So well done. Leagues uh, ahead. So, so he builds his Iron Man armor mm-hmm. in the classic fashion. And they actually they actually do a nod to the the uh, Iron Man theme from the from the uh, cartoon from the cartoon, yeah. uh, but that scene where he's got the anvil and he's hammering down and it's just oh it's so good, uh, and the classic suit it's the the nice nod to the original the Mark One armor yeah. yeah it looks great it looks the right amount of patchwork. Well, know? if you look at the armor in the comic, it's actually gold, but they yeah did a, that's right yeah. yeah they did a nice. Uh, Sorry, we turned because yeah. there's actually a frame of the original comics on my wall. Um, but yeah, so so his his armor is gray, um, but they do original. That was definitely a nod to the comic back in the day. Um, and so so yeah, he has uh, he has his gray armor, which was also in the original comic as well. Uh, and so he puts on the puts it on, gets out of the cave. Uh, there's actually some nice celebrity uh, appearances in there. One of the henchmen is Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine. Uh, in like the Ten Rings? Like yeah, he's one, oh, of the, wow. one of the members of Ten Rings. And the guy, the lead singer, Sergio from System of a Down, is also a member of the Ten Rings. <laughs> um, because John Favreau is well-connected. Uh, and anyway, so yeah. Breaks out of the cave. Beautiful scene. Flies out. Uh, and then they send. he gets back. And then he immediately has calls for a press conference. And that's when we get the introduction of Agent Coulson from the Strategic Mr. Homeland Coulson. Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division. I'm going to say something that's going to make you lose a bit of respect for me. But 
throughout the entire movie, the first time I watched it, I remember sitting in that theater and the whole shield thing went completely over my head. I was like, oh, he's from a really long named oh thing. Oh my God. What a God. silly name for a silly. What? And then, This is the first time he's telling me this, by the uh, way. So I'm, I'm a little shocked. <laughs> and when it got to the end, uh, I remember I was sitting next to our friend David Schilling. Uh, oh, and and, and it, it got to the end, and then she's like, "Oh, I'll call you at the strategic blah blah." And he's like, "Just call a shield." And I remember I went, <gasps> I, "Like I, I, I audibly reacted." Uh. And David just kind of looked at me and went, "Really, dude?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, you know, I do remember that watching that with you guys, and I remember it, it was my second time watching it. It wasn't the yes. first; it was my second. time You did that with Transformers as well. Yes, we went with you, but you had already seen it. And uh, when when the movie let out, the old man tapped you on the shoulder who'd been sitting behind you because you had been reacting very physically with your whole body. And he said, son, uh, you were more entertaining than the film. Than the film, yeah. And I think he's right. That was for Transformers, that by the way. That was for Transformers, yeah. <laughs> um, which, again, at that time, we hadn't seen a movie like that. So I'll, I'll give that movie points yes. for the strict purpose of that. It was the first of its kind. But comparison to where we are today you could do a way better transformers movie mm. um but michael bay did have some nice moments well nice they moments. did it's called bumblebee it's it's, it's... called uh megan fox uh no, <laughs> <laughs> uh no no just kidding um but no the car chase scenes were anyway anyway uh we're we're off topic here but my point is is that i saw it a second time with you because i didn't know about the end credit sequence the first time ah, and i found out only the after the reviews came mm. out Anyway, so, um, yes, that was my big Marvel mistake. Numero uh, uno. At least you only made it once. Yeah. But yeah, Coulson, it was, I got a little squee of joy last night when I saw him again. Because it's been so long. And oh, I mean... What a missed opportunity with that character. Uh, he was great. And I, I don't know, I'm sure you watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I, I did. I didn't stick through it. I got to like season three where, mm -hmm. I forget her name, the really pretty British girl, Simmons, I think she got stuck in like a parallel universe. The negative and zone. And then, yeah, yeah, they got her out and that was literally the last thing I saw when she got out. You're not the only one to fall out. Actually, mm -hmm. at that time, my brother and I also fell out at that time and then they, then I find out later on that they come out with a new Ghost Rider and just, yeah. like, I I can't believe Ghost Rider's in the MCU and, mm -hmm. and like sell that man sell show it. us that yeah that's don't hide him there. it wasn't johnny blaze but I'll, I'll give it points for being the newer ghost rider um but anyway i want to i want to land back because we're we're in a momentum here i want to hmm. land back but yes agents of shield fell off the map a little bit and i think colson was a wasted opportunity in the long run of things i don't know what he is yet in the season finale i haven't watched agents of shield so maybe they changed the story but and I will talk about this when we get there. Uh, but I thought he would have made a great original Captain Marvel before the Captain Ooh. Marvel movie. Because his name was Coulson and the name in the comics was Lawson. And it was just like, you could have lined it up so perfectly. And it makes sense because he worships heroes. And it, and and uh, Captain Marvel... Um, he was all about humanity, the humanity, and that's why he wanted to save Earth. And what and it would made sense that Coulson was the sleeper agent the whole time and why he loves heroes because it relates to the humanity. Big missed opportunity, but at this time, we didn't know where Coulson was going. I just thought he was a really good agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, and so, yes, you mentioned Strategic Old Man. So for me, there was a big nugget as well, like right. S.H.I.E.L.D., holy crap. And at this time of the comics, there was a huge uh, pivot because they were going with the Ultimates. That's right. Yeah, the Ultimates had, was a big thing. Yeah, the Ultimates was a big thing. Um, and there's a kind of an influence of the Ultimates at this point with the Infinity Saga, although they use the stories from like the 80s, the Silver Age. Mm -hmm. um, most of them were like most of the aesthetics were kind of leaning towards the Ultimates a little bit. Um and so, so Coulson, yeah, so Coulson, when I heard it was S.H.I.E.L.D., I was like, oh, man, they're bringing in Nick Fury. And I was thinking of the Clint Eastwood-themed Nick Fury, oh, okay. which would have been really nice. Uh, not that Clint Eastwood would have played him, but if you look at the original Nick Fury, he's very much based on Clint Eastwood. And he's kind of got that Western cowboy kind of speak to him if you yeah. want to in see the cartoon a... he was always chomping a cigar if i remember right he yeah was, uh, yeah yeah he talked as if he had a cigar in his mouth yeah. and, he, and there were scenes he had a cigar a lot in his mouth 
Um, but if you want to see a good media representation of the original Nick Fury, watch the Spider-Man cartoon. Um, mm. That's where you see kind of a really good, solid representation of the original um, uh, Nick Fury. But anyway, the Ultimates did their version of Nick Fury, and they actually asked Samuel L. Jackson permission way before this movie was filmed if they can use his likeness for Nick Fury. That's right. I, I remember seeing that in Wizard and mm-hmm. being like, oh, that's cool. And then uh, when I was reading these interviews, there was an interview with Samuel L. Jackson about Snakes on a Plane because mm-hmm. uh, that came out around that time. And they were like, so uh, have you gotten a call from Marvel to be Nick Fury? And he's like, they haven't called me, but man, I'd be so down to play him. Yeah. And look where we are now. And look, uh, where, we dude, are now. look where he is now. Oh, no. Jeez, Louise. Um, so, so at this point, we're introduced to it. And then Stark has this realization during his press conference. And I love... And again, this... You guys have to understand, when you watch this movie the first time, really pay attention to that award ceremony. Yes. Because that sets the tone for the entire film in terms of his character development. Um, And he, and and again, you know, Rhodes refers to him as a real patriot. And and he talks about, if I gave you an award, you would show up and you'd be incredibly honored. And he isn't. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about on the plane... He's like, when I put on my uniform, I, that's who I am. And he's like, you know what? He talks about how he's not responsible and he's not the hero and, and starts just ignoring him because, you know, he's providing him with all the weapons and everything he needs. So he feels like he's doing his part. And the first thing he says at the press conference, he says, I never got to say goodbye to my dad. And he looks at, he looks at Obadiah and he goes, there's some things I would have asked him about you know what he thought about what he was doing and like what he thought his company was made of so already you have that beautiful pivot and again setting that tone with that film right and that scene always i'm sorry to like punctuate your beautiful summary of that with something Mm. so childish but that scene always makes me want to eat a cheeseburger (laughs) always the burger king cheeseburger when i was watching it i was just like god i I would kill for a wendy's baconator right now oh yeah watching this scene Mm. uh and now, somebody who's present at that press conference that I really want to talk about is Christine Everhart. Um, yeah, she surprisingly, I thought her role ended with her at the Stark House, but right? with the introduction of Jarvis. Yes, Jarvis which was is huge. Here. Yeah. Another introduction we missed. And Jarvis in the cartoon was AI that was project, projected as a hologram. Yeah, he was named Homer in the cartoon. Yeah, yeah, that. and then no, he does turn it, turn his name into Jarvis. Oh, cool. There was iterations of him. And so, yeah, uh, and so Jarvis in certain comics is a real butler, mm-hmm. and and they do it in Who has sex Aging with Aunt Carter. May, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. I think he gets mm-hmm. it on with Aunt May. He gets, uh, he finds some tail. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, he found out about great responsibility there. No, hi uh, So, anyway, um, so we learned about Jarvis, uh, which was awesome to see, and Christine Everhart, and yes, she's at the press conference. Now, yeah, that that's like... She again. I felt the same way as you. I forgot she she's in this movie a lot. Like, she's, she's in the a, whole movie. She's yeah. like a huge role. She shows up like four times. And I'm like, oh my god. I literally thought like there was just that one scene and that's it. Now, first of all, it, is she a Marvel Comics character or is she a new? Creation? I think she's a character. She's I'm a character? pretty sure she's a character. It's a very like her name is a very comic booky name like mm-hmm. Christine Everhart. It, it just sounds like it fits. Mm-hmm. Now. I, I was so fascinated by her when I finished watching this yesterday. And I want to know what your opinion is on this. What do you think her deal is? Like deep down inside in Christine's ever heart, what do you think her deal is? Because the way I watch it, I'm like, okay, she goes up to Tony. She puts on this like casual smiley face, starts asking him like questions. And then boom, she drops the bombshell. Did you know, oh, you're this. People have called you a warmonger. People have called you this and that, a monster. And they have this, this back and forth. And she's, you know, she's clearly not a fan. And then next thing you know, they're having sex. Yeah. And then she leaves the next morning. And then next time you see her again, she's like, hey, did you know that these people in Golmera, blah, blah, blah. Like for the rest of the movie, she clearly is like she was at the beginning. Like, I don't like Tony Stark. She's She's got this smug look on her face every time she's there at a press conference. She clearly wants to see this man fail. So what do you think is going through her head like, oh man, I hate this guy so much. I can't wait to go make him look like a fool. I'm going to do a piece on Vanity Fair and he's going to look awful, but I'm going to sleep with him too. Like, where, what do you think is going through her head? Is there ever any point where she's like, yeah, Tony Stark's a good guy? I think that, well, I think he proves that, right? Because he tells her that he invented these IntelliCrops mm-hmm. for uh, for the military. But she still hates him after, like that's at the beginning of the movie. And she's well, still- she's she's... 
no because like she has a i don't know there's a way to interpret it though because because she does have that moment of where he's like um he talks about the smart homes and the and the the, the intellicroms and i can't remember the, the, uh, the i can't remember if it was smart homes or what it is but he mentioned something mm-hmm. he mentions the intellicroms and he goes all those breakthroughs which i'm assuming were huge in the marvel cinematic universe he's like we're military funding and i did it right, right. and i made it and she has this moment where she pauses and she's like wow like and then she's like do you practice that every mirror like yeah so she's still challenging objectively what he's doing right but i think he, when he plays those subtle tones of like oh i'm prepared to lose some sleep with you kind of thing I think she's still a little taken back because she's when she wakes up in the morning she's happy to like she's happy to look for him. She's like, "Hey, Tony, where are you?" Right. And then Pepper delivers the whoo, savage oh, line to savage. which we were to which we were introduced to Pepper the the yeah. famous Pepper Potts. She looks so beautiful. Oh, Gwyneth, so Gwyneth stunning. Is a beautiful lady. Um, and so she goes, "Oh, you're the famous Pepper Potts." And again, great introduction of a character. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a great way to introduce a character is have have another character recognize this right. character. And again, Christine is very rude. To Pepper when she meets her, she's yeah. like, "Oh, Tony's got you taking his dry cleaning now." Like, yeah. I do everything and uh, anything Tony Stark asks, including taking out the trash. Yeah. Boom! <laughs> Mic drop. Mic <laughs> drop. That was such a burn. Uh, but yeah, so uh, so then you know he's he's working on the hot rod and he's got the incredible suicidal tendency song, uh, which is institutionalized. A great song. Yeah. What's the deal with that song? I made that in my notes. I'm like, what is he listening to? What's going on? Like, oh, oh, I did such a bad job. Oh, I hate my life. I'm like, what's going on here? Yeah. So that's, that's a real song? That's a real song. Okay. It's, it's done by Suicidal Tendencies. Um, okay. And it's, it's Suicidal Tendencies is not what you think when you hear the name Suicidal Tendencies. It's actually an uplifting band. It's a very positive band. I was going to say their other hit song is Sunshine, Lollipops, and Rainbows. Uh, they have some weird ones. They have like uh, they have one called I Saw Your Mommy. And, and the song goes, I Saw Your Mommy and Your Mommy is Dead. But Ooh, okay. Institutionalized is a famous, famous song. In fact, uh, our generation uh, was... Uh, was uh, you know, all about Limp Bizkit. Mm-hmm. And in one of Limp Bizkit's songs, um, he says, all I wanted was a Pepsi, just one Pepsi, far from suicidal. So they got the tendencies to reminisce, mm-hmm. right? And that lyric is obviously a nod to the song Suicidal Tendencies Institutionalized, where he, he that song is played, and for a very specific reason, because he's, t- he's complaining about his parents. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. He, it's the song is all about he just likes to do things and it just turns out the way he doesn't want him to and and he talks about the parents are like keep interrupting him during his like just what like while he's listening to his music um and they're and the parents are saying we noticed you had a lot of problems lately we noticed you haven't been yourself and in the song they also say um in the song he retorts to his parents calling him crazy and weird He's like, I'm crazy when I went to your schools, I went to your churches, I went to your institutional learning facilities. How can you say I'm crazy? So clearly it's a it's a rebel yell towards his parents. Right. Okay, and that's fitting for Tony. All mm-hmm. right. That's mm-hmm. fitting. Yeah, cuz just on first impression I was like, what is he listening to? This is a, I'm a, I'm a guy who grew up on Michael Bolton and Celine Dion, so yeah. <laughs> anything harder than that I get kind of put off. But uh now we like coming up is is my um probably my favorite scene in the whole movie yeah which is uh when he asks pepper like can you how, how small are your hands can you please come oh yeah yeah and help me um because that that whole scene where she's you know she's trying to help him out the whole operation thing mm-hmm. oh, i love that so much like that is their that is the moment where you're like okay these two are are uh like they're they're more than just employee and, and employer they uh they're friends mm-hmm. and for Tony, friends are in short supply. He literally only has his, his, well, technically all he has is Pepper, but he also has Rhodes. But I think he looks at Rhodes as more of a, a co-working buddy as opposed to someone personal. Um, and then their friendship grows a lot as, as, they, as they go through it. And, and again, I think it's a beautiful friendship. And I think that the beauty of his friendship prepares him for meeting Captain America. Yes. Right, because Rhodes is a Rhodes is a true like soldier and everything. So, 
So yeah, so it's a beautiful scene to establish that there's obviously more between Pepper and and again, I think like I love that they focus on what I will label as the soap opera side of superheroes mm-hmm. because comic books they they have actually a lot of those storytelling elements there that you're you're very well versed with. But obviously because it's a comic you get more into the action as opposed to the storytelling, but there is some small panels of dialogue between characters that's more of a soap opera side of it, like the romances and, and the and the confrontations between characters, conflicting ideals. Um, but the movies really draw on the relationships where you don't see that too much in previous superhero movies. No, like, and it's so, like, I'm so thankful we have the MCU the way it exists because you can really take your time with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that sort of connectivity gives you the exact soap opera experience. Yeah. We had four Batman movies, but guess what? Vicky Vale was in one of them. And every bit of his relationship with Vicky Vale had to be crammed into that one movie. Yeah. It wasn't like she yeah. stuck around. Yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, we got some problems with our relationship, Vicky. Let's work through them. No, it's like Vicky's gone. I did, now it's Catwoman I love. Like it, it Yeah, and that's it, right? Like it's those the, yeah, so so you have Pepper and you have the relationship and you see the arc reactor in his chest, which is again Great nod to the comics, mm. um, and uh, and when in fact it used to be just a giant chest plate that he used to wear, as opposed to the the reactor that came much later, uh, and so that was a beautiful scene and uh, and a great way to establish that he's working on he's already working on his next iteration right uh, of Iron Man and uh, and. Uh, I mean, that sequence of him building the new suit is absolutely hilarious. Oh, man. The people in the audience were loving it. I don't think we were used to laughs like that in a superhero movie. No. We were, I, I can't think of a, another superhero movie before that mm-hmm. that would have been in everybody's recent memory. Yeah. You know, maybe Spider-Man 2. Maybe. Uh, and that's debatable because a lot of Spider-Man 2 is a very melancholy movie. Yeah. Like, bad stuff happens to him. Yeah. The, there, it was such a breath of fresh air to watch a superhero movie where everybody in the audience is just having a hoot. Oh yeah, they're just oh yeah, they're just having a hoot, man. Um, but it was it was done the humor in the MCU is, is really clever. It is so well done because you look at the pacing of Iron Man, um, it's the humor is so well balanced within the theme of the movie that it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel um, it doesn't feel set up. It right. it happens. Um, my, f- my favorite during the testing sequence is he talks about the chief thrust lift and he goes 10%. Now the fun fact about this, as we talk, I'm going to talk about the whole sequence as a whole. Um, so he gets the armor and once he wears the first modern silver armor, when it's more skin tight and yeah. more sleek, I literally had goosebumps. Like I was like, oh. uh. and you have to understand guys, like talk about the time in which this film was. The visuals, mm. that armor looks so real. Like it looked incredibly, like it looked like you can go out and buy this armor. And it looked like it popped out of the comic page. Yeah, exactly. It felt like that moment. And they talk about this in the behind the scenes stuff. They talk about Marvel moments. Mm-hmm. And, and that's exactly what they were going for. And as a fan, it literally felt like it like it jumped out of the page like it just felt like such a like a comic book moment so he takes the armor he flies out and then he, he tries to beat the the SR72 record mm-hmm. by flying as high as he can and he gets the icing problem whatever um and so he has to break the ice and and he he goes for the fall and the whole experience is actually interesting because afterwards um all that engineering talk he spews out uh my best friend Boris uh, was talking about it, and he was saying that the language he was using is actually accurate. Oh, it's wonderful. real science that he's talking about, and he was talking about how, like, the type of metal to uh, the type of metal they were talking about was a uh, similar metal that they use for planes to prevent icing in the wings and everything. So it's it's actually like a legit legit science talk, and it's it's really cool because. Um, yeah, you kind of yeah, you get into just the armor and the excitement of the armor. And when you see him going through talking about the chief thrust of the 10%, uh, my friend Boris knew that he was going to fly up and hit the roof <laughs> because, because that's, that's a strong lift for, for his body weight his because he doesn't weigh that much. Mm-hmm. So that's when he does the 1% and he's like hovering. So all that 
stuff there, which is what Marvel always does best. They try to make the science feel as real as, and as close to the real thing as possible. So, Do you think we have ever seen Iron Man jetting off at 100%? at any point in the MCU? Oh, I couldn't answer that. That's a, that's a Boris question. Uh, for okay. Sure. All right. Boris is going to be on the show. Yeah, Boris. Yeah. Confirmed. Yeah. Confirmed for Iron Man. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, well, no, cause I think he does. Cause he goes supersonic. Oh yeah, that's right. He yeah. breaks. Yeah. He yeah. breaks the, uh, so he does it in this movie. He too, breaks yeah. the sound barrier. You're yeah. absolutely right. Um, so yeah. So which is, we'll get to that. So he does this testing. Great scene. And I love the shot. We get to see the shot of him under the, the, the mm-hmm. helmet. Which is so iconic now. Mm-hmm. It's so iconic. And it's such a great way to, to see him. Because the beauty of it is, is it just, it's so immersive. Like it's yeah. just such, a, and again, it felt like, and it, it really meets the time of our technology because user interface is a big deal with us right now and how we interact with things. So, you know, with phones, we have, you know, the beautiful easy menu screen layouts and then and navigation. Same with computers, you have your desktop screen. So what would the suit look like? And the suit is very much based on how he sees things, right? And, and obviously you see him target the car and then it gives him all the information. Right. So it's kind of like, it kind of feels like virtual reality is the way his helmet is designed, which is incredible. Uh, and yeah, so incredible sequence. And then he gets invited to... The, the Disney concert hall mm-hmm. uh, for the, the thing. And, and Spookily um, accurate for the... They, yeah. they were, it's like they were looking at a crystal ball. Foreshadowing a little bit. Hey, hey uh, Tony, it's Disney calling. Uh, we were wondering if you could bring your money, I mean, yeah. your bank ability, I mean, you yourself, to yeah. our concert hall. Mm-hmm. Just, you know... Just for for talks, yeah. uh, nothing serious. We may bring some, put something on the table, <laughs> offer wise, but you don't have to take it. It's I'm just gonna leave it there. But come by, bring a date if you want, and and it's gonna be there on the table. Yeah, and and it's funny because Stan Lee's there looking like yeah. a rich mofo uh, man. He's looking like a rich mother. <laughs> uh, but love Stan. We get our first Stanley cameo in the MCU mm-hmm. uh, side of things, as because he's been in uh, he was in X Men and Fantastic Four as well. Uh, but he gets his cameo uh, as uh, Hugh Hefner, or what, <laughs> what Stark believes is Hugh Hefner, uh, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and then this was a good turning pace of the film. Mm. Um, and uh, Christine Everhart returns, shows him the photo, uh, talks about accountability. Yes. So now he's learned about responsibility, and now he's learning about accountability. Um, and so, and again, thought I thought Christine Everhart, you know, the actress that plays her, incredible job i totally thought she was gonna be in that one scene but she keeps yeah. coming back and hitting those hard hard acting beats and uh and then we get that beautiful moment with pepper of course and agent colson's there and again reminding him of shield and i love the joke where he's like oh gotta be at a better name yeah, right? I know. <laughs> but yes and then she brings the photos and she goes it's from a town called gomira hitting home from where jensen's from and they have the Jericho missiles. Mm. Uh, and so, and then you see the Obadiah stain turn. Yes. That's when you start to realize not at all is as it seems. And again, I love it so much because that turn is revealed to you when, not through like an evil monologue, whatever. He's literally got his arm around Tony. Yeah. Looks like a picture. Picture time. And then he's like, I was the one who wrote that indictment. And I'm like, oh, oh my God. Yeah, the injunction. Yeah, uh, no. yeah the injunction. No, so, no. Yeah. Oh. It was so good because actually fun fact about that scene the, the not not the all the lines but most of the lines and the choreography of the scene layout was all improvised wow wow not all the like the structure of the the dialogue was there mm-hmm. but they improvised a little bit of the back and forth that's great and 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 yeah and they didn't know what to do with the scene they didn't know what to do with the shot and talk about good writing and talk about talk about good storytelling mm-hmm. is they didn't know what to do with the shot because it's a point of confrontation Right, it's the first time Stark's starting to realize he's been asleep at the wheel, and yes. and and Obadiah has been steering, and it's not going good, and so so they're like, okay, they're having this confrontation, but how do you? Because it needs to lead somewhere, it needs mm-hmm. to needs to break it. So they're like, okay, so you in the back, behind the scenes, you see them kind of talk about it, and that's where the shot is, and this is a Obadiah move, um, Jeff Bridges move. 
he puts his arm around his shoulder and turns him to the camera and says, picture time. And so he, he's forced not to react. Yes. And oh. that is a checkmate move if I've ever seen How one. How can people say Marvel didn't do good villains before Loki? Right? How oh, my God. That? And what's great about it is, like you're saying, this is the turning point. Um, but it's it's such a, a unique turning point for Tony yeah. because never did it enter into his mind, at least as far as we know, to be to use this suit for super heroics on yeah. a personal scale. He's just like, oh, cool. I built a suit. I can fly. But he's just, you know, he's just fooling around with it. But Obadiah kind of, he gets hoisted by his own petard here because he's like, I did this bad stuff and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what makes Tony say, I'm, I'm going to do something about yeah, it. Yeah. And he goes home. He leaves the party. He's like, oh, you re- you've painted my suit, Jarvis? Okay, I'm going to go clean up Obadiah's mess. If Obadiah hadn't done what he did, he wouldn't have created the the hero who would eventually stop him. Well, he was he was always working on the hero, but he was the hero without a purpose yet because mm-hmm. he didn't know. He just didn't know. And who right. knows when he would have found that purpose had it not been mm-hmm. for Obadiah being a greedy mofo. Oh yeah, the so, double dealing man, double oh, deal man. So so this beautiful. So we get that beautiful scene. He's back home and they're talking about Gomira. You see the ten rings again, uh, and they talk about the ten rings and uh, and yeah. So. He, and then you get that beautiful scene and he's kind of like fixing his, his armor. Yeah. But the beautiful shot when he puts on the armor for the first time. Oh. <laughs> and I love how it's not like I'm a badass. Like that's not what's coming across in his face. He's pissed. Tony is pissed and like he's fuming. He's almost ready to like if if that if those machines don't work fast enough, he's just gonna run to Golmira without his armor. Oh yeah. Ugh. But no, like yeah, the the tone, the anger, the the purpose, the yeah. accountability, right? Like it's all coming in. And so puts on the suit, um, and you get the helmet, the helmet drops, flies over. Now what what were you thinking in the theater when this when you saw that red and gold? Pure goosebumps. <laughs> Pure. I was excited the first time he fl- uh, did the fly through and everything mm-hmm. to a point where I like had the soundtrack because I love that song where he flies for the first time. Um, this time around, when he's got the armor on, I'm like, like, like this is where I'm like, this is a comic book. Yeah, like, this is a comic book, and this is the moment. This is an incredible moment because this is the action. This is the big build up to the action you've been waiting for. Mm-hmm. And this movie, like. Aside from the beginning, there's no action for like a good yeah. like hour. Like a good hour. And then you have him fly. And this is a great shot. Like this felt so comic booky. So he lands and just and he talks and it's cool because like you see him use the repulsor technology and it's it's called re- repulsor. So it pushes people away. So one thing what you need to realize about Tony is everything he because of the situation that happened to him uh, in in uh, in the whole Ten Rings thing, is he builds the suit to protect him and push things away from him, mm. right? Yeah. So he gets down there, and then you see that beautiful shot. Boom, punch here, blast there, punch through the wall, pull the guy <laughs> out. All those cool things. Um, you I s- remember everybody clapped in the, in the audience when he, uh, he targets... The guys who are holding the civilians hostage. Yeah. And they're like, oh, no, no, you can't shoot us. And he literally is like, beep, 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 boom, and just done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just snaps him out. Um, I love the, uh, the, I love the uh, flying through the air, and then the tank shoots him down. Now, one, talk about continuity. Okay. That tank shoots him from the sky. Okay. Mm-hmm. For the rest of the, the entire MCU, he nurses his left arm. Because he was shot. Are you kidding me and right he was now? Shot in his left arm. Wow. And also, when he flew out of the cave, he was wearing a cast on his left arm. Mm-hmm. So that's he always nurses his left arm. Oh, I can't wait to look out for that now. Oh, buddy, you're oh, gonna love man. that when you see it. Now, is this his whole thing in Golmera? I, mm-hmm. I wasn't sure. I put it in my notes. Is this the only time mm-hmm. in the MCU where? One of our lead heroes is just straight up killing fools. Like, is this the only time this happens? Um, no, because Cap kills fools. Oh, Cap that's kills right. a ton of fools. It's been a while since I saw Cap one, but I'm yeah, it's World War Two. He has no choice. He has no yeah. choice, and okay. he and he takes out some 
some dudes pretty badly. Okay. Um, yeah, he, he shoots a lot of dudes. Uh, did Thor, though? I don't think Thor did. Thor Thor killed, like, elementals and stuff. but Yeah, he killed, like, zombies and things yeah. like that. And uh, speaking of the desert scene, there's, there's something I wanted to bring up. Did you notice the? Uh, there's two very big Star Wars references hidden in this movie? No. Yes. What did I miss? What did I miss? And it, again, with, with the hindsight of it all, now we know. We didn't know back then, but now we know that Jon Favreau is obsessed with Star Wars. He's yes. making The Mandalorian. Uh, there's can't two- wait for that by oh, the way me neither. now one month away man we that, are- that's it where the clock is ticking clock is ticking he put in some great references first of all when tony um has come back and he's he's in his lab and he's he's spinning it's the first time we see him like spinning with his computers and throwing stuff out and stuff yep they do a lucas wipe they transition with a George Lucas wipe. Yeah. And what they transition to is back to the desert in Afghanistan mm-hmm. with all the Ten Rings troopers combing through the sand for the pieces of his Mark I armor. Oh. A lot of the One of them even holds up the helmet, just like the guy's like, look, Looks sir, droids. <laughs> yeah. That scene begins and ends with a wipe. And I was like, oh my God, I saw what you did there, Favreau. Oh, I did not see that. That's genius. And then at the end, when, when he's having his battle with Ironmonger, uh, and his, his, he's, he's on his uh, his old arc reactor, so there's not a lot of power. Mm-hmm. And Jarvis keeps telling him, like, oh man, you're losing power, you're losing power. And, and Iron Man's like, let's, let's uh, let him follow us up to the atmosphere. And Jarvis is about to say something where he's like, sir, the odds of blah, 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 blah. And Tony cuts him off and is like, I know the math. He pulls a never tell me the odds on Jarvis. Oh, like, it's <laughs> so genius. It's true though. Yeah, I I wish I picked up on that. Wow. Oh, that's... that made me so happy. Yeah, well I was done. like, I, I see you, John. I yeah. see what you're doing. So uh, so at this point, uh, he's in the desert. Uh, gets shot by the tank, falls down, and then the beauty is he launches a little missile and blows up the whole tank, mm. and then. Uh, so then the beautiful chase scene with the fighter jets was so well done and that was all over the trailers i remember that was like their Mm. that was what they showed off to the world it's a classic kind of iron man shot though he does a lot of like like sky clouds flying through the air kind of scenes so it's kind of a classic nod there um i love the conversation with Rhodes, Mm -hmm. where he's like uh it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not an equipment. It's a suit. I'm in it. It's suit. Yeah, it's me. It's me. A great shot. Uh, and um, yeah, no, that was a great scene there. Uh, and again, fun fact though, another fun little nod that I noticed in there. Uh, one of the the military guys as they're going through the computers trying to figure out what it is, is the guy, one of the actors is the guy who is in Batman Begins who tries to blackmail uh, Batman. Oh, that dude? Yeah, that guy's in it. Oh, is he the guy who's like, I don't care uh, if if you have a shot, you no, take no, it. That's no, that's not, not him. Him. that's not him. That's just a just just a dude. That's just a, a but he man. says it's not. He's like, hear them. It's not us, sir. That's him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh. So yeah. Anyways, he's there. Uh. So that that was kind of a funny little nod. Um. And then I love that the the training BS thing. Mm-hmm. Training BS. Yeah. The usual BS. <laughs> Uh, and then the unfortunate training exercise. He was a good Rhodes. Uh, Terrence Howard was a good Rhodes. Um, I loved Don Cheadle as as, oh, yeah. as War Machine. I mean, they're both great iterations. Um, one I don't think is better than the other. I mean, we have seen obviously way more of Don Cheadle, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say Terrence Howard was a terrible Rhodes. I think he had the stern, stoic kind of feel to him. Yeah, he was great. He was super likable. Mm-hmm. Um, he we felt that this was a guy who was like super professional about his job. Yeah. But when he sees the Iron Man stuff, you can see like, he's like a kid in a candy store and he's like, Oh man, this is really cool. Oh no, yeah. And, yeah. And like that just endeared us to him so much. And I think that Don Cheadle, cause he's so freaking talented. He, yeah. he, he carried that through where he's a pro. He's good at what he does. He's yeah. a military man. Yep. But he's just like, I like to have fun too. And look at this suit I got to pilot. Isn't that oh, neat? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, road, when Rhodes gets the official war machine suit, it's mm. just, ugh. Um, speaking of which, so yeah, so we have we have the the training BS scene, um, which was really well done. Great action sequence through and through. Uh, and then yeah, so then we have your beautiful scene when he comes back, takes out the bullets, and then he asks Pepper to go on the mission mm-hmm. to the office. Oh, that office. And uh, and so I was looking at the files, and again, you don't really get to see anything. You know, not many Easter eggs there. 
But it's a great scene to point out because, again, going back to what you mentioned earlier, was the dialogue where he goes, so what are we going to do about this? And it's all kind of a double entendre yeah. of uh, of the, the... I know what you're going through. Yeah. <laughs> and I know what you're going through. And he's clearly just talking about how Tony has changed. Yeah. <laughs> but she's like, oh my God, he found me. And I'm looking... <laughs> it's just such a clever shot. And there's such well dialogue. Um, such well constructed dialogue. And again... It was just a great scene, and it was a great scene. And then we get Coulson, and then she's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna tell you." Oh man! Yeah, and then, uh, then we get a better look at uh, Obadiah. Uh, well, we just before these events, we get a look at Obadiah being in the desert, working with um, what's his name, whose name we've completely forgotten. Mm, and he's got a little sonic thingy. Yeah, and he's, cool technology. Yeah, there. very cool. Uh, and then, and then he talks about. You know, uh, you know, sharing uh, robs Tony Stark of the the chess reactor, yeah. which the beauty of it is, is that they used. <laughs> I love in Spider Man Far From Home. They used the exact same actor who was the yes. scientist in the uh, Sector Sixteen. Oh, do you know who that guy is? Somebody mm-hmm. told me who he was, and I was like, "Oh my god, who is he?" He's the little boy from A Christmas Story. No yeah. way! He's oh Ralphie. my god, Ralphie! <laughs> you know what? I should have known. Yeah. Should have known. But I love that they. I, I was funny. I saw it with my uh, fiance, Spider Man Far From Home. She's like, that, that, "That's not the same guy from that." I'm like, "Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is." They went and got the original guy. So anyway, so they got it, and it's great. It's a great scene where he's like, Tony Stark was able to build this in the cave. A bunch of scraps. A bunch of scraps. Oh. Love that line. <laughs> and again, he puts his arm around that guy when he walks in. Why haven't you finished Charming, this? Charming, yeah. Uh, even when he when he uses the sonic thing on Tony, he sits on the couch, and then what does he do? He puts his arm, and he's like, look at this. Look. And he like encircles it around his neck, so Tony has no choice but to look at it. Yeah. He's so invasive of your privacy. I love that. It's so good. And so, yeah, great scene. And then, yeah, so Pepper does the whole screensaver shot thing, uh, and then finds Coulson. And then, um, so, yeah, so uh, Tony's having the cardiac arrest, essentially, and um, gets his gift, which is proof Tony Stark has a heart mm. from the dummy robot, which is great. Uh, so the fight scene, Obadiah versus Tony Stark. Iron Monger versus Iron Not Monger. Yeah. That's what his versus actual name Iron is. Man. Iron Man. Yeah. So this is a great scene because they, all everything's adding up now. All the things are coming together. Shield's now involved. They blow the door, which is really cute. It's a great scene with Pepper. That might have been, I think, my biggest laugh rewatching this. Because yeah. I forgot, like, I forgot how, you know, Pepper had to grow. Like, she's, she's become this badass now. She's like, uh, what's that character's name? Impulse? Not Impulse. What is she now? That Oh, that Rescue. Rescue. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's become a superhero unto herself. But I forgot, you know, at the beginning, she was literally just like a corporate lady. Uh, like a corporate person who who's not involved in this kind of stuff. And you see her like all mm. flustered and like, Ooh, what's that? Is that like a thingy that's going to pick the lock? And Colson's like, you, you might want to stand back. Like, that was <laughs> so covers cute. Ears or anything, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it, like the thing is though, you can't underestimate Pepper because in the comics, she's very much a big character mm-hmm. um, and an original Stan Lee character uh, because of the double uh, alliteration on their name. Yeah. Uh, that's how, by the way, if you, for those of you who do not know, that's how Stanley would remember characters, is they all had a double alliteration to their name. So he would remember who they were. So that's why you have your Reed Richards, Scott Summers, Peter Parker's, Pepper Potts, Eddie all Brock. those names. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. Um, oh, man, there's so many. Susan Storm, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, all those names uh, were all uh, part of helping him remember uh, Stephen Strange. Yeah. All that stuff. Anyway. So, uh, but Pepper Potts is a big character, huge character. She helps organize and coordinates the Avengers and all that stuff. So, yeah, she eventually gets her own armor and becomes Rescue. Uh, but, yes, at this point, we know what she is in the comics at this point, And we know that she's there. So, it's just nice to have her there. Uh, Shield's doing their thing, which was really cool. Seeing the Iron Monger again. If you look at it now, the effects still hold to date, the visual effects. Mm-hmm. But at the time, guys, it's groundbreaking stuff. Groundbreaking it looked real. It felt real. It felt like this actually happened. Um, and beautiful scenes. Yeah, and then, again, this was a great Marvel way to defeat or, or partially defeat a villain was he outsmarts him by using something he learns yes, earlier, which 100%. is 100%. And I forgot that, again, I forgot so much that that doesn't 
that's not what takes down Ironmonger. Mm -hmm. When I'm watching, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, he's going to fall because of the ice and that's it, he's dead. I forgot that there's more to that fight. Yeah. I kind of wish that at some point Ironmonger had put his arm around Iron Man and been like, Tony, <laughs> look at my big gun. You can't go anywhere. I made some improvements too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, was, it was really well done. And so the fight scene's incredible. We can go talk about all day. And again, Marvel moment, another Marvel moment where Iron Man does the, the wind-up punch. Mm -hmm through the air which was really good and then of course the whole joke and again how the movie all comes together is through adversity uh tony stark builds a miniature arc reactor to create iron man yeah meets obadiah after to debrief him and then uh obadiah makes fun of him being like the arc reactor it was a science project shut the hippies up it never worked it mm -hmm. was never a thing and then he ends up getting destroyed by the one thing he thought that wouldn't work. So, See what happens, Obadiah. See what happens. Outsmart and outwit. Yeah. That was a marvel. That was a truly a marvel way of defeating an opponent, right? Um, and then the beautiful the podium scene, and I love the scene. And uh, again, you have Coulson saying it's Shield. You have that aha moment, which is a shame. Mm. You should have known better. I know. I'm sorry. But they <laughs> they did change the acronym for Shield though, because I think. In the comics or the cartoon, it was strategic. Welcome to Strategic Homeland International Espionage Law Enforcement, Enforcement Division. Division. This one's Strategic Homeland. Uh, oh, what is it? Strategic Homeland. It was very clean. I mean, yeah, it's, it was, it's not like Spectre and James Bond where you're like, how the hell does yeah. that make sense linguistically? No, this was a very clean yeah. acronym. But yeah, when he said it. Logistic. I, logistics, logistics. Yeah, yeah. Logistics division or something like that. But yeah, the acronym is a bit obscured a little bit. So so yeah, so <clears throat> that happens. You get S.H.I.E.L.D. And then they talk about how he's a bodyguard. Classic yes, reference. right from the cartoon. Yeah classic reference that he was a bodyguard because for the longest time you can see it in a lot of the cartoons uh the animated movies uh he does reference that it's a bodyguard and you'll see iron man make fun of people that use stark technology because to play on the whole bodyguard thing mm -hmm. so that was a nice little nod um and then you have the beautiful line where he says i am iron man yeah what a way to go out yeah. again flying in the face of the superhero movie culture where it's like hide your identity Keep everything safe. Nobody knows Bruce Wayne. Nobody knows Peter Parker. Nah, that because that's not Tony. Tony, as he's reading that, he's like, "Are you saying I'm some kind of superhero? Because that would be fantastic." And like, awesome. it, and again, Christine Everhart, front row center, front like, row center, and she comes back for the whole like yeah. the whole film. She's literally she's in the beginning, middle, and end of the film. Yeah, it is nuts. And and also, I will also point this out is at this time during the comic book run, Civil War was going. on. That's right. And and what does Iron Man do? I am Iron Man. I am Man. Iron Man. It all ties to see, I think I think this this is a sign that Christine Everhart is Hydra and Annihilus. She's <laughs> Nihilus. Oh that's my god. it. This is we we got the Infinity now Saga, awesome. now we're gonna get the Everhart saga. She's the big bad. <laughs> She was she was Modoc the whole time. You heard it here first. If you, you unscram the letters in Christine Everhart, it spells out, "I'm very bad." <laughs> um, I'd be amazed if you could actually uh, <laughs> scramble it. No. Uh, anyway, so a beautiful thing, and then they kick off with the the classic, uh, the Black Sabbath song. Um, I think it's War Pigs. Is this? Is it was, this no, song. it's Iron Man. Oh, it is Iron, Iron Man. Yeah. And actually, speaking of songs. I didn't realize again that this was uh, the the music was done by a guy named Ramin Jawadi. Do you know who Ramin Jawadi is? Like he has gotten huge since then. Mm -hmm. He is now like one of the composers to watch out for. Like he does the music for the Westworld TV show. Oh wow! He did the music for Pacific Rim, Good and he for did him. the music for a little show called Game of Thrones. No, including the theme song. That is him. No yeah. way. Mm -hmm. wow that dude's underrated he is fantastic and th there's plenty more he's done that i'm just yeah. forgetting but yeah that's yeah. him oh well damn so yeah, yeah damn damn that's, that's amazing there's great soundtrack too that movie um now let's talk about the end yeah talk about the Man. end credits the uh the end credits <laughs> that i missed the first time and then i had everyone now at this point people still respected non-spoilers so when people told me that there was an end credit sequence i can't they didn't tell me what it was so I can't, I, was, I can't believe the second unit audio guy's name was frank like that was that that credit <sighs> sequence yeah. blew me away oh sorry after, after yeah, after, yeah, after yeah okay, yeah, okay yeah. so 
<laughs> well, it's funny too because we were in in our programs, uh, or sorry, in our program, we were uh, we were told like, do you guys stay to watch the end of the credits? And at yeah. the at the time, nobody did. No, absolutely no. I would I if there's someone from our class listening to this podcast outside of our little nerd circle. I dare you to challenge me to say that you watch the credits. I don't believe you. Yeah, there's, jerk. Yeah, there's yeah, Chris. No, yeah, Chris. I love you. I miss you, Chris. So, so yeah, there's no way I would not. I would not believe you. But so this was a really clever thing that Kevin Feige did because he loved Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and mm. he said that when you watch the credits, you get a nice little little nugget at the end. But man, did he drop a huge nugget at the end? He drops. So in the end, he drops Nick Fury being introduced and Samuel L. Jackson playing Nick Fury. What a move. And the beautiful thing is, is he goes, I am Iron Man. You think you're the only superhero in the universe, Mr. Stark. You've just mm. become a bigger part of the universe. You just don't know it yet. Um, that line actually was not the line they used. Well, well, sorry, that's the line they used, but it wasn't the line they, they recorded originally. Right, yeah. You said there was another take that yes. came out <clears throat> in the public eye, and I totally forgot about it. What's he say? So he says, as if radioactive spider bites, uh, gamma bombs, and, and assorted kinds of mutants weren't enough. Mm. I have to deal with this spoiled little brat who thinks he's a superhero. And it's... It's a great. I wish they used that. I line. like that a lot better. Yeah. I wish they used that line, but at the same time, at this point, you got to remember: Sony had Spider Man, yeah. Fox had X Men. They can't use the word mutants. So it was obviously this end credit scene was a payoff to let fans know there's a bigger picture to this. Right. Yeah. And and he's and that's the end line where he says, "I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers Initiative." Ha. Mm-hmm. Ha. And, and it, it, it's the only the only thing that I didn't like about that scene mm. was now watching it because I'm like the Avenger initiative never really became a thing until everybody was kind of already around mm-hmm. like it, it obviously you know they can't have that much foresight but back then yes 100% mind blowing um the scene wasn't spoiled for me but everybody was just kind of guessing like hey there's a rumor they want to make an Avengers movie, and there's a rumor that you're going to see Nick Fury in the post credit scene, and he's going to basically spell that out, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, now, did people when when people told you like you missed the scene after the credits, did they tell you what you missed? No, they didn't. So so luckily at this time, um, my brother my brother and I uh, my brother read it on the internet that we missed the end credit. There's an end credit scene, and it's mm. really big, and he's like, we need to go back and see it. And then I watched it with you guys, and then um, and then uh, I had friends also tell me. Uh, some of my my other nerdy friends were telling me that um, yeah, there's a there's an end credit sequence, but no one ever told me what it was. So when I saw it was Nick Fury, I was like, oh. wow! Um, and it was it was incredible at the time too because I was reading the Ultimate. So when I saw it was that Nick Fury, it was it was incredible. But yeah, I the, they they pulled from the Disney vault, and I swear to God, I want to rob that vault one day. I, just, <laughs> I know, right? Goddamn vault! I thought we heard the last of it because when the DVDs used to come out, they'd be like, "Oh, we pulled it from the vault," mm-hmm. and I was like, "Oh, damn you!" Because I know that vault now has the original Star Wars cut. It has the. <laughs> it has, I think it has both Fantasia movies, which I don't own. Yeah, and I should. And your last name is Fantasia. Uh, but anyway, so so it's a great line, great way to kick off the movie. And so for me, I have to give this movie an Infinity Gauntlet. Wow. Oh, I have to. Wow. I have to. Yeah. And I tell you why because one, it kicked it. It literally created a paradigm shift mm-hmm. for fans and for new fans to love it, and it set a whole new tone because. Comic book movies were super like, like, like they were good, but they were corny, cheesy, and just entertainment. Like they were just mm. entertainment. This movie proved you can do a story, you can do a like a dramatic story, you can you can uh, make it believable, you can make it serious, you can make it all these things, and and after that. Everyone wants the piece of exactly. the cinematic universe. Everybody. You've done a YouTube thing on how all other franchises want a piece of this MCU pie. And like, and that's the thing, man. 
DC's been trying to do it and failed terribly. Um, the horror monster thing tried to do it, oh, failed terribly. That broke my heart. I wanted that to be so good. Yeah, and oh. uh, and and so many things. So many people have tried to do what Kevin Feige has done, and it was all a calculated risk. Mm. They knew it was a risk going into it, and they set this tone, and that's why it deserves an Infinity Gauntlet. It has to. I'm doing. I know this is like the beginning of our podcast, and we should build up to it. If it's gotten it, I no, know, right out of the gate. But you know what, man? Going into this tonight, driving on the way here, I was thinking of what my rating would be, and I kept hovering at six Infinity Stones. But that's I, a gauntlet. Buddy. I think. I'm sorry. I think you made a case right now that, uh, like, in my little jury box, I'm like, you know what? the verdict should be an infinity gauntlet. So I think I'm going to join you up at that podium and say, yes, I am Iron Man and I deserve an infinity gauntlet. Cause this, uh, this really, for the first movie, you know, when you look at great franchises and you look back at their first movie, sometimes you're like, Ooh, yeah, there's a, there's a bumpy road ahead before we get to the good yeah. stuff. But nah, right out of the gate, they come out with something that is just all across the board, 17 different kinds of good. So I, I can't give it less than an Infinity Gauntlet. I don't think I can. You can't. You no. can't. And you were talking about it. You have you have a villain that's not an arch enemy, but probably one of the most memorable villains. Um, now, this is another thing we should keep track of. How many villains have died that are good villains? Because mm. we lost Obadiah, and it, I'm just going to leave it there for now, because as we do this podcast, you're going to start to see... They get rid of a lot of good villains. You know what? Let's start a body count. Let's start a body yeah. count of like major characters. Yep. So right now we got Obadiah. Obadiah yeah. Stane, Ironmonger. He's our first major yep. death. And the the MCU cemetery. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna drop him in a plot there. All yeah. right. That's and, a good idea. And then you have comic book character wise, you have Tony Stark, Pepper Potts, James Rhodes, uh Obadiah Stane, uh, you have um Christine Everhart. You have, and one we haven't barely mentioned, if not not mentioned at all, Happy, Happy Hogan. Hogan yeah. Happy Hogan, who was big in the Silver Age of Iron Man comics. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's there. You Nick have Fury. Nick Fury. Uh, Coulson wasn't, um, although you could, again, speculation-wise, we thought he was a comic book character, yeah. but he wasn't. Howard Stark, though. Is definitely- Howard Stark is a comic book character. Um, and then you have the mother, too, who's a character. Mm-hmm. Um, Maria. <laughs> it actually is Maria Stark. So <laughs> very close to Martha. I hope Martha. you're listening, Zack Snyder. Martha. I actually, I liked. I thought that was a sweet moment. I, I, I know people make fun you, of Martha. Just, I, I thought it was very sweet. I really liked Batman v Superman, the three hour cut, not the theatrical cut. Yeah, I liked everything except. Ooh, I'm Lex Luthor. Ooh, <laughs> look, at, look at all this hair I have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh God. Uh, um, but yeah, so we have about ten characters ish um, that were actual comic book characters. Uh, Christine Everhart, I'm I'm leaning on the side of yes. I'm pretty sure Christine Everhart's. Well, if character. if uh, she's a nihilist, which she is, then uh, yeah, she's definitely a comic book character. Yeah, 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 no. So so that that's that. But yeah, Happy Hogan is a is a big mm-hmm. big comic book character from the Silver Age. Uh, they he's a bit more aloof than than the movie is, but um, because he's kind of like a Larry Curley and Moe type of yeah. character. But they they did a good job monitoring. Like again, what you guys are going to notice with Marvel formula um, is Marvel formula. The way the movie works is they take events from the comics, but how they get to the events is completely made up. Like how, like the, how the film wants to do it, but they'll take an event and they'll say like this event. Okay. Let's do that, but let's change some of the characters and let's change how they get there. Right. Which makes total sense. And that's how they get there. Right. Um, Now with this movie, uh, where was I going with this? I was going somewhere with this. Uh, b- 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 How Christine becomes oh. a nihilist. No, 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 no. Okay. So Marvel Comics, what made them brilliant back in the day was they would tie it to events happening in the real world. Mm. But the way the movies are doing it is they're tying it to how how modern we are today in terms of social social things and 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 some political climate. In the comic books, they're very much a satire on political climate, but they kind of touch on tones there as well. So you kind of, at the time, what we, what, what the world was going through was very similar to what was going on, um, in Iron Man a little bit, except for the intervention of Iron Man. 
<laughs> but yeah. yeah, but overall, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the political climate wise was pretty close with what, what was going on in the, uh, the Middle East. So, pretty see, cool. and our professors said comic book movies wouldn't <laughs> teach us anything. Look where they are now. Pro- I don't know, yep. probably still teaching. But uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, this has been a, a big, chunky episode, but I think we had a lot of fun. That was Iron Man. And what a way to kick off both the podcast and the MCU. Uh, now I'm just oh, I'm so eager to dig into the other movies because this has been mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Uh, thank Ooh, you. Yes. Hold on. I got to stop you because oh, I did find on? it. I did Breaking find it. news. Christine Everhart is an actual character. So I was right. Mm-hmm. And what I remember her from, because I read a lot of Spider-Man comics, she was a reporter from the Daily Bugle. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. So at, one, at some point, Jameson's going to be like, give me a picture of Spider-Man. And she's going to be like, I'll do you one better. I'm a nihilist. I'm going to wipe out the human race. Yeah. So there you go. You heard it here first. Uh, but that has been <laughs> Infinity rewatch ryan thank you so much man thank you this this is a dream man. this is great this is what i feel so like good. we were made for this oh like yeah our whole relationship was built up to having <laughs> this podcast get off the ground oh yeah uh but the, we can't wait to talk about marvel more and more who knows maybe i think you're right i think we might be depending when we release this caught up by the time black widow comes out which would be really cool but we'll see what happens either way we're going to talk about black widow when it comes out so hell yeah we're gonna go see it day one and it's gonna be great four yeah maybe day 19 but that'll be it yeah (laughs) but thanks so much guys like i really appreciate this and again thank you ryan for coming out and telling us uh you know sharing your stanley-esque skills thank you man with the world we will be back with the incredible hulk that's up next so eat your spinach put on something green and join us for the incredible Hulk that should be out in two weeks' time from whenever you're hearing this. Uh, but until next time, guys, have yourselves a marvelous day. And you won't like it, but I'm angry. <laughs>